Symmetry is all around us. From the mesmerising patterns found in nature to meticulously crafted examples of architecture and artwork, symmetry is the secret code that gives order, balance and structure to our world. Our eyes seek symmetry and patterns in everything we see, and it is often the property of symmetry that evokes a sense of beauty and aesthetic harmony. But what if I told you that symmetry is not just a feast for our senses, it is also a fundamental principle in the fields of science and technology. From the microscopic world of crystals with their repeating patterns, to the precise order seen in mathematical equations, symmetry is the language through which scientists decipher the secrets of the universe. Not to mention, symmetries are incredibly important to the work we do at CERN too, where we conduct experiments to study particle physics. The theory behind this work is called the Standard Model of Particle Physics, and this theory is in fact a theory of symmetries. Believe it or not, many theoretical physicists, if asked to write down the Standard Model, would rather write down this unassuming expression and call it a day. Although this might look like the scrawlings of a mad scientist, it actually is quite clever. Let's try to make sense of it together. In this video, we will venture into the field of theoretical physics, which is the branch of physics that uses mathematical concepts and logical reasoning to make conclusions about the universe. It goes hand in hand with experimental physics, which acquires data using scientific instruments and uses systematic observations to explore physical laws. Theoretical physicists use symmetries to make predictions which experimental physicists can then go on to test. These predictions help them to know what kind of experiments to conduct and what kind of data to look for. Today, we will learn how symmetry is defined and introduce the language mathematicians and scientists use to describe it. We will discover the link between abstract symmetries and the real tangible laws of physics we know and love and attempt to understand how fundamental symmetry really is to the standard model of particle physics. Let's do this. Now that we understand why studying symmetry is so important, let's dive further into understanding precisely what we mean when we talk about symmetry. We have some intuitive understanding of when objects can be described as symmetrical. For example, you might know that a butterfly's wings are symmetrical on either side. If you drew a line down the center of its body, you would see that the right side is a mirror image of the left. Snowflakes can also have this property of being the same on both sides, but they also have another kind of symmetry, since we can rotate it by an angle and see that it is the same. There are countless other examples of symmetric objects, but in order to generalize this concept and use symmetries to understand our world, we must use a more precise mathematical approach. Don't be scared though, there won't be too many numbers involved. To mathematicians, symmetry is defined as the property of an object being invariant under some action. Let's break this definition down a bit further. An action is just performing some change to the object, like when we rotated the snowflake earlier. Invariant is a fancy way of saying that the object does not change after this action is performed, like how the snowflake appears exactly the same after rotation by 60 degrees. There is no way for you to know that I had performed this action on the snowflake if I hadn't shown you. Let's take a look at three of the most important types of symmetry actions, reflection, rotation, and translation. Reflection is when an object can be divided into two equal halves, with each half being a mirror image of the other. You can think about this by picturing folding the object along a line. If the two halves line up perfectly, like how each of the dots of this lattice align after folding, then there is reflection symmetry. Earlier, we saw an everyday example of this type of symmetry, the butterfly, which has reflection symmetry about its vertical axis. Rotation is when an object can be rotated by a certain angle and still appear the same. When we rotate this lattice of points by 90 degrees, we can see that the dots align with their original positions, so it also has rotational symmetry. We've also seen rotational symmetry before, when we looked at the snowflake, which can be rotated by 60 degrees and look the same. Translation is when there's a repeating pattern or design, so that you can shift along a direction by a certain amount and observe the same pattern. This only really works if we consider objects with no clear beginning or end. If we move this infinite lattice to the right by a distance equal to one square, we can see that it lines up with its original position. So it also has translational symmetry. There are many other types of symmetries, but these are by far the most important ones to be aware of when studying physics. The symmetries of two-dimensional shapes are particularly easy to understand and to visualize. So it is important we understand these first before we can study more complicated symmetries. Let's take a look at a familiar shape, 
the equilateral triangle. This is the triangle with three sides of equal length and three angles, each measuring 60 degrees. It exhibits reflection symmetry. It can be folded along this, this, and this line with no overlap and rotational symmetry. It can be rotated by 120, 240, or 360 and look exactly the same. This gives six symmetries in total, three reflections and three rotations. We say that an equilateral triangle has discrete symmetry, since there are only a finite number of actions that leave it the same. Now, let's look at another familiar shape, the circle. Again, we can see that there is both reflection and rotational symmetry. This time, however, we can choose any line which goes through the centre of our circle as our axis of reflection, and the circle will still fold in half with no overlap. Similarly, we can rotate the circle about its centre by any angle, and it will appear exactly the same. So how many possible symmetry actions does the circle have? Well, actually, there are an infinite amount of them. The circle is an example of what we call continuous symmetry. There are no jumps or steps in our symmetry, like there were for the equilateral triangle. Instead, the actions are smooth transformations, so that we can rotate by any angle or reflect about any axis. Discrete and continuous symmetries are not just limited to the two-dimensional world. A cube, for example, has discrete symmetry, since it has a finite number of symmetry actions. A sphere, on the other hand, is continuously symmetric. No matter which way or by how much I rotate this sphere, it appears just the same. So now, we are able to talk about symmetries in a meaningful and precise way, and as physicists, that helps save us a whole lot of work. Instead of painstakingly tackling complicated systems, we can study some small part of them, and by symmetry, assume the rest works the same. We now know that symmetry is the property of an object appearing the same after we make some change to it, and that there are three key symmetry actions, called reflection, rotation, and translation. We also learned that symmetries come in two forms, one with distinct jumps, called discrete, and one with smooth transitions, called continuous. Now that we have a more precise understanding of symmetry, we can begin to delve further into the language scientists use when describing symmetries. The branch of mathematics that deals with the study of symmetries is called group theory. Now, that's not to be confused with group therapy, and we'll make sure that you don't need any of that to understand what group theory is. First things first. A group, to a mathematician, is a very different concept from our everyday use of the word. So, not that. Rather, it's an abstract mathematical object. This means that it does not exist in the real world, and so we cannot observe it, but we can study it mathematically. It's just like with sets. Sets are collections of objects, which we call elements, such as the set of all natural numbers which contain the numbers 1, 2, 3, etc., until infinity. We cannot see this set in the real world. Sure, if you had unlimited time, you could write down every element of the set, but while this would describe the set, it would not be the set itself. The set only exists as a mathematical object, and so we can only study it using mathematical concepts. So, let's define what a group is. This is going to sound a tad formal for a bit, just stay with us. A group is defined as a set of elements along with an operation that combines any two elements to get a third. To be a group, the elements of the set also have to relate to each other in a very specific way. The group must follow certain rules, called closure and associativity, and contain special elements called an identity and an inverse. Right, so to make sense of all this, let's try take a look at an example. The specific type of groups we are interested in are called symmetry groups. In a symmetry group, the elements are symmetries of an object, and the operation is composition. We now know, of course, what symmetries are, and composition simply means applying one symmetry action and then another. That's the operation, just adding the symmetry actions. Let's go back to our trusty equilateral triangle. We know from earlier that there are six distinct symmetry actions for this shape, three reflections, and three rotations. These six symmetries are the elements of the symmetry group of the equilateral triangle. Now, mathematicians have come up with a fancy name for this symmetry group. They call it D3. 
where the D represents that it is the symmetry group of a regular polygon, and the three is because the triangle has three sides. Let's look back at our definition of a group and try to understand it in terms of this group. The elements of the set are the six symmetries, here labeled from A to F. The operation is composition, and we're going to use a plus symbol to represent it. For example, B plus D simply means carrying out B first and following it with D. So we first rotate the triangle by 120 degrees and then reflect it along the vertical axis. Now, let's tackle the checklist of properties the group has to satisfy. Firstly, the group must satisfy closure. This means that when you apply one action followed by another, the end result will be the same as if you had applied just one different action, which is also a member of the group. We say that we have closure, since no matter how many actions we apply, we still end up with another action in the group. It's like once you obey the rules of the group, you cannot escape. Imagine a chicken trapped in an egg. It's trapped inside unless it does something to break the structure of the egg, like crack it open. But then the object is no longer really an egg. It's just broken pieces of shell. The same can be said for a group. If you want to obtain an element that is outside of the group, you must do something which breaks the rules of the group. But if we break the rules, we can no longer call it a group. So the group must obey closure. Let's see how D3 shows this property. Again, we'll take the example B plus D, first rotating by 120 and then reflecting along the vertical axis. If our group satisfies closure, this should give us something that is precisely the same as applying just one other action of the group. It can be difficult at first to figure out what that action might be. But if we play around with our triangle, we can see that this is exactly the same as action E. So B plus D gives E, which is of course another member of our group, as we had expected. Next, we know that the group has to satisfy a property called associativity. This one is simple. It means that when we combine three elements, the order doesn't matter. We also know that the group must contain an identity element. This just means that one of the elements should be the same as doing nothing. For us, this is of course action A. You might think this is silly to include. Why should we care about doing nothing to the triangle? Of course it appears the same after this action. How could it not? But containing this element is actually very important to the structure of the group. Without it, we would not be able to say that the group satisfies closure, for example. Imagine you apply action D and then apply action D again. Since we must have closure, we know that we must get some other action from the group. But wait a minute, the triangle is exactly back to where we started. So D plus D must be equal to A, which we call the identity element. The final rule a group must obey is that for every element, it should also contain a corresponding inverse element. This means that every action must have another action that can be applied after it to get the identity element. In other words, we have to be able to get back to the original triangle. Let's look at action E. To get back to the original, we must flip along this axis again. So action E is its own inverse, and E plus E is equal to A. The same is true for each of the other reflections. Action B's inverse, however, is action C, and vice versa, since they add up to one full rotation and bring the triangle back to where it started. Finally, the identity element is its own inverse. Doing nothing twice gives the same as doing nothing once, so A plus A is equal to A. All right, so now we're finally through all the requirements a symmetry group should satisfy. One important thing to note about symmetry groups is that they are not specific to the shape they describe. If this was the case, there would be no need for the fancy group names. We could just name them after the shape. Two different shapes or objects can have the same symmetry group. Just like how two different objects can be described with the same length or color, the symmetry group describes the symmetries of the shape, not the shape itself. The example we've looked at, D3, describes the symmetries of an equilateral triangle, but it also describes the symmetries of all of these shapes, since they can all be rotated and reflected in the same ways and appear the same. They have the same symmetries as the equilateral triangle. The snowflake we looked at earlier would have the symmetry group D6, which is also the symmetry group for regular hexagons. So in the end, symmetry groups only care about the symmetries of an object. 
to a group. A five-pointed star is the same as a regular pentagon. Different objects, same symmetry group. The distinction between discrete and continuous symmetries that we encountered earlier is also important in group theory. Let's look at a symmetry group called C3, which describes just the rotational symmetries of the equilateral triangle, and so has three elements. This is, of course, discrete symmetry, since there are a finite number of symmetry actions, and so its group has a finite number of elements. But what if we increase the number of sides? Well, we get a square, whose rotational symmetries are described by C4, which has four elements, and then a pentagon, and C5, and five elements, and on and on, until eventually we get to a regular shape with an infinite number of sides, more commonly known as a circle. We have seen earlier that a circle is an example of an object with continuous rotational symmetry. And what this actually means is that the group describing its rotational symmetries, C infinity, has an infinite number of elements. The circle can be rotated by any angle, no matter how small. So it makes sense that there are an infinite amount of group elements. With that, this is the end of our little journey into mathematical group theory. We are about to dive right back into the physics. In this chapter, we learned that mathematicians use the abstract concept of symmetry groups to study symmetries. Symmetry groups can be both finite and infinite, corresponding to discrete and continuous symmetries. Okay, so now that we have some understanding of the way scientists formalize descriptions of symmetry, it is time to find out exactly why they are so interested in them in the first place. It all has to do with one of the most important and fundamental principles of modern day theoretical physics, called Noether's theorem. Emmy Noether was a brilliant German mathematician who lived at the turn of the 20th century. In 1915, she proved that for every continuous symmetry in a physical system, there exists a corresponding conserved physical quantity. In other words, if you know that there is a continuous symmetry, you know that some value or property of the system will stay the same over time, even if changes happen in the system. Noether's theorem transformed the way physicists approach problems and ultimately became central to many of the last century's most important physics theories. Let's look at some examples to get some intuition as to how this theorem works. First, let's consider time translation symmetry. This may sound like something from a cheesy sci-fi movie, but all it really means is that the laws of physics yesterday are the same as the laws of physics today and will still be the same tomorrow. In other words, the laws of physics are invariant over time. We can verify this symmetry experimentally. When light from a collapsing star, also known as a supernova, hits the telescopes we have here on Earth, it has traveled a long, long way. As light travels through space at a finite speed, it takes some time to reach the telescope. This means that the light that we observe is actually light that left the supernova at a much earlier time. In a way, this makes telescopes sort of like time machines, since when we look at objects far, far away, we see them in the distant past. Astrophysicists have studied supernovae which have taken place in the distant past and have compared them with supernovae that have happened more recently. They can see that the laws of physics are exactly the same, since the supernovae happen in the same way. So I guess we have time translation symmetry to thank for the fact that we don't have to wake up and learn new laws of physics every morning. By Noether's theorem, we know that time translation symmetry has some associated conserved quantity, and it turns out that it is in fact a familiar one. Time translation symmetry leads to conservation of energy, which means that energy cannot be created or destroyed, but only converted from one form to another. This law is used in almost every area of physics. Without it, it would be almost impossible to predict how the systems we study behave, since it would mean that an object could suddenly get a burst of energy from nowhere. Another interesting example of Noether's theorem in action is space translation symmetry, which means that the laws of physics remain the same regardless of position. This is why you can conduct experiments in the labs at your school and expect to use the same laws of physics as scientists use across the globe. That's also why, whether I drop this ping pong ball here or all the way over here, we know that we can use exactly the same equations to analyze its motion. Space translation symmetry leads to conservation of a quantity called linear momentum, which is a measure of how hard it is to make an object accelerate. You may have heard of Newton's third law, 
which says that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. This law actually comes about as a direct result of the conservation of momentum. So, in this chapter, we have learned that for every continuous symmetry in a physical system, there exists a corresponding conserved physical quantity. This is Noether's theorem, and it is at the core of many physics theories. Okay, so now we are a bit better equipped to take a look at the standard model of particle physics. This theory is one of the most significant and successful frameworks in modern physics. It describes the fundamental interactions between elementary particles. Normally, when we learn about the standard model, we use graphics such as this one. As we said at the beginning of this video, though, this is just one way of representing this theory. It shows the elementary particles, but it doesn't give us any information about how they interact. So many physicists prefer other representations. There are four fundamental interactions in the universe. Gravity, electromagnetism, the weak interaction, and the strong interaction. The standard model does a great job of explaining all of these interactions, except for gravity. In fact, one of the great goals of physics today is to try and come up with a way to include gravity in this theory. Out of the three other interactions, you've probably heard of electromagnetism. And if you haven't, check out our Electromagnetic Adventures mini-series. Electromagnetism is responsible for electricity and magnetism, as the name suggests. But it also allows light to travel through the universe as electromagnetic radiation. The weak interaction is responsible for particle transformations, for example, in certain radioactive atoms. It is harder to see in our everyday life, but without it, the sun would not shine. The strong interaction allows quarks to attract one another and bind together to form composite particles like protons and neutrons, which each consist of three quarks. And with that, we're finally ready to take a shot at the enigmatic expression I showed you earlier, U1 cross SU2 cross SU3. This expression is actually built with names of symmetry groups, just like the groups we looked at in this video. That's because the standard model is in fact a theory of a special type of symmetries, called gauge symmetries, which are related to the fundamental interactions between particles. The structure of these symmetry groups is much harder to visualize and to understand, so we won't go into too much detail about the specifics, but we know from Noether's theorem that these symmetries will have a corresponding conserved physical quantity. Actually, each part of the expression also has an association with one of the three fundamental interactions described by the standard model. U1 is associated with electromagnetism through the conservation of electric charge, and SU2 is associated with the weak interaction through the conservation of a quantity called weak isosphin. Finally, SU3 is associated with a strong interaction through the conservation of another quantity called color charge. Now, understanding these last two is a bit too ambitious for this video, and you'd need to spend a bit more time studying the maths and physics behind the theory to really get what's going on. Maybe you should come study particle physics at CERN to figure them out. But what we can understand now is that the standard model of particle physics can be expressed in terms of symmetry groups, and that by Noether's theorem, each of these groups have corresponding conserved physical quantities, which are the bases of the three fundamental interactions described by the theory. So now, you can see why our theoretical physicist earlier would just write down this expression. When you understand the maths behind it, it describes the same thing as the table. Not to mention, it is far easier to write down. So, we hope that you've gained an appreciation for the symmetries of our world and their role in physics. That's it for today's video. Thanks for venturing into the world of theoretical physics with us, and we'll see you soon in the next video.